Major funding for the Ring of Truth was provided by Polaroid Corporation. For 50 years, we've been bringing art and science together to change the way people see the world. Polaroid. Additional funding was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Public Broadcasting Stations, National Science Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations. chosen a very busy time. Come on, Red. You're only a second image and not present at the game at all. I would have to agree with that. But after all, Blue Friend, what are you but still another image at a different time? I freely concede. All right, Carlo. Let's go back and look for the picnic effect and see if we can take it apart. Sure. That's the original. The playoff game itself. That's correct. And that's the picnic in the studio under the special lights. That's correct. And the silhouette? The silhouette is the electronic hole that will be filled by the image. And you can cut that into the background? Right. It looks something like that. That was a nice shape. And then we can fill it with a picnic. And now let it all move? Sure. And there it is. The scene that never existed. No one was fooled by our infield picnic for long. But we wanted to remind you just once how easily this medium can tamper with time. What you see flow by so smoothly on the screen did not always happen that way. I promise never to do a deliberate TV trick again. In this series, we take a sharp look at how we know what we know. In particular, since I have been a physicist and a teacher of science at every level for 50 years, we look at how science knows what it knows about this varied world. We will share a wide range of experience in the lab and outside of it. Jelly donuts and moving vans, drill ships and lasers and telescopes, rainbows and diamonds, and distant galaxies. We will question each experience by argument and reflection and then test our judgments anew. I can persuade you best not by citing some high authority, but by letting you look along with me right inside the works to see whatever it is that persuaded me. So you have a part to play. You need to attend to what is going on. It is up to you to decide whether what we present has that ring of truth. We begin with a look at our own vision and then follow it as it extended over the years to see far beyond the stars. First of all, we inquire about an instrument you are using right now, the eye itself. No one can see a thing through closed eyelids, yet we all blink frequently. 
The amount of time you spend with a pair of closed eyes is about 5% of your waking moments. We ignore that loss. The flow of vision is unbroken. The film camera of the engineers blinks even more insistently than the human eye. This is the very model camera we're using for making the film. Look for yourself. The light is so much interrupted by a solid metal shutter that this instrument, the camera, omits half of what is going on. We begin to grasp how these two instruments are kin, the one of glass and metal, the other of flesh and blood. The flip book is only a series of snapshots, pose after pose over a long sequence. What I did as the camera clicked was there was no flow at all. The same snapshots sped before the eye and the old smooth motion returns, even though it was not present. Plainly, the eye and the mind want to find continuous motion in the world. Our familiar judgments are drawn from what we usually see. Jeff McBride is out to intrigue us by frustrating those everyday expectations. people to understand not how tricks work but how their eyes perceive different things uh, because a good magician if he's gonna if he's gonna fool you or a good illusion if he's gonna if he's going to do an illusion for you is gonna get you that's his job whereas your job as a scientist is to uncover things and to reveal things we try to take all of science and hide it as much as we can and use everything that science teaches against our audience. But you see, these are two sides of a coin. Yes, the and same coin. The same <laughs> coin, exactly. The coin of perception, right. the coin of misdirection, uh -huh. which nature is producing if you, the clever magician, does not. Your game is to make causes that don't have effects and produce effects whose causes you have concealed. Right. And then we put them together and we think the cause makes the effect, and it probably doesn't. Mm. The rabbit was not in the hat. The rabbit is not in the hat. Yes. You can use people's information against them. People only have two eyes. They can only move in one direction, and they can't focus on two things at once. So what you do in this particular effect is seduce their eyes with a very slow motion, while your other hand is moving very quickly. 
if I take the paper ball, which you've been seeing today, yeah. and hold it here, if you're looking here into my hand, I won't see it. you can't see it go out of frame. Oh, oh. yes. But exactly. then again, you've been watching this paper ball go up and down all day, and when it was tossed, it vanishes. Now you know that is how that happens. So what we have to do is just change your preconceived oh, notion of what the paper yes. is like that. Yes. See, I. <laughs> That's right. A master magician fooled us by exploiting the limits of our vision and the expectations we bring to it. Here in the Exploratorium of San Francisco, we have instead the pleasure and surprise of fooling ourselves. A mirror put into the light path can certainly influence the visual judgment. But there it is, external, visible, and somehow easy to understand. Visual judgments require internal processing in the eye and the brain, sometimes consciously, sometimes quite unknown to us, but it is present. Our judgments are internal and the processes are not simple. One demonstration of that is a rather recent set of effects, which I would like to show. I have a beautiful, fresh, clean page of white paper and a few cut pie disks of black. When I arrange them properly, of course without marking the paper in any way, I see, and it will take some time for the processing to go on, you have to be a little patient about this, but I already see a second sheet faintly lighter than the ground which is covering these four and can be seen at its edge there as well. That is made internally. It's not in the paper. It's not in the discs. It's inside. We can change the variables too. Here is a change to red instead of black contrast discs, to curved lines instead of straight lines in the cut, and to three discs for a triangle instead of the four for the square. I think the contrast is not as good with the red as it was with the black, but I think I still see faintly a curved contour and not a straight line. What a remarkable kind of processing is going on. The visual system inside the eye and the brain somehow want to describe what we see in these patterns by imposing a single screen above it, a, as it were, a second sheet of paper, a little whiter, a little different from the ground. That's what happens all the time. In a way, we are entering the third dimension with that judgment, because of course to hide something I must cover it as one hand placed above the other, and ever so slightly we have put depth into the flat scene of the paper and the discs. This set of boxes is a genuine test of our perception of space. Many people will see this as being lighted from above in spite of the fact that my hand shadows it from below, and if I put it above, I make no shadow. Nevertheless, the view is so compelling that you will not accept the cues of shadow. These are not boxes. They're hollows, they're the corners, the insides of boxes, as my hand will show. But when I close one eye, as the television camera is one-eyed, and look at them from here, I see them, the top lighted, the corners protruding, little cubicle boxes, half a dozen of them arranged for me to see. And of course, when I move my head, the boxes, quite strangely, move to follow me. Now I have a part of a cube, three faces, which of course has an inside corner 
and an outside corner. If I hold it in my hand, in almost any lighting, and look at it, I can easily persuade myself, in fact, I can hardly do otherwise now, that I'm looking not into a corner, but at an outside corner of the cube. Very pleasing. And then I have the remarkable result that when I move it slightly, its motion is contrary. It seems an animate thing in my hand. I have inverted the space, and with that, inverted the motion. What has happened must be quite plain. The two-dimensional retina has not enough geometrical information from the simple cube to say which way it is, inward or outward, and it has made the wrong three-dimensional inference. That's what we try to do always, to judge a 3D world from inadequate clues. <laughs> we always proceed by the use of the inborn instruments, the eyes, the ears, all that we call the senses. Compare that with the way of science. There, too, it is instruments that bring view after view of the world around. This little compass is determined to point in a particular direction. And I believe that its cousin is apt to corroborate it. And it does quite well. These are scientific instruments. They were not developed in the hands of modern science. They go back well beyond a thousand years. But I believe they fulfill the most characteristic role of scientific instruments. They extend our perception. They show us something we could not otherwise know. They extend the senses. True, these have no counterpart in eye or ear or the other well-known human senses. We cannot feel or see in any way the direction they choose to point. There are many scientific instruments that extend our senses beyond the sense of vision. Here is one. It is a commonplace radio. Considered the right way, I think it too is a marvel. In a moment, it brings me voices, signals from all around the world, depending on the day, the time, the hour, and more technical material as well. We think of it as a fixture of everyday life, but it is more than that. First of all, it is a scientific instrument, for it discloses phenomena right here on the table that I had no other way of knowing. Experience I could not gain without using the intricate structure in this little box. Probably the most commonly used of all scientific instruments apart from the ordinary mirror, is this one, a pair of reading glasses. They augment human vision at the simplest level, aiding an elderly natural lens by adding an external lens of glass. Spectacles arose seven centuries back, not out of any great understanding of the eye, but from the chance experience of some observant artisan. What is wonderful is that the same form, the same materials, and the same skills gave rise in due time to a landmark among scientific instruments whose new views soon transformed our concept of the universe in which we live.
is in a great library like this that we should expect to find evidence of scholarly men using eyeglasses. The painting with the eyeglasses is the first such visual representation known anywhere. It is, for me, irrefutable evidence that the artist knew and had seen men who used such glasses. It does not mean that the venerable cardinal whom he paints ever used such glasses. That's not the kind of evidence you'd rely upon from a painting. No, it was the painter who had seen the eyeglasses, who recognized, moreover, that they were proper and useful for venerable scholars to have, and who painted them among the workers in the great library in the old monastery of Treviso. These paintings were done somewhat more than 600 years ago. Now, that's not the earliest use of eyeglasses. It's unlikely the painter would have arrived here just at the time they were invented in this place, most improbable. But they were somewhere nearby and somewhere not so far away so that this could be the first representation of all of the eyeglasses. And the scholars have found the evidence for that too. It is not visual, but written evidence. It comes from a sermon written down, as was delivered, 50 years maybe before this painting, in a city some distance away in Florence, when a visiting priest said these words one cold Sunday. It is not 20 years since there was discovered the art of making spectacles to see better, one of the most useful and necessary of arts. I have myself seen and spoken to the man who first discovered and made them. So said the priest. Now for me, the words, though they are clear enough, are not quite as good as the painting. We don't know just what those spectacles were. Were they really so close to the modern form as we saw in the painting? But taken together, there can be very little doubt that the making of spectacles to improve sight began about 700 years ago and has spread until now they are surely the most common optical instrument in the world. The aristocratic Republic of Venice had been a great maritime power for centuries. Commerce, crafts, ideas had blossomed there, as had the making of spectacles itself. It was still lively around 1600 in that sea-wedded state, although the center of growth was shifting west toward the Atlantic. Born into an old and talented Florentine family, Galileo Galilei was professor of mathematics in the famous University of Padua, which served the Venetian state. He was redheaded, brilliant, energetic, a superb writer, unusually gifted with his hands, a fine musician, even a good judge of wines. Galileo set up a small precision shop in his home to build apparatus for his own research. He supported the shop and the skilled artisan who worked with him by making and selling all over Europe a clever brass calculator of his own design. The two knew the busy world of the craftsmen of Venice nearby and took full advantage of their materials and know-how. The Venetians banished the smoking furnaces of their glassmakers to this nearby island seven centuries ago. And for 400 years, Murano remained the leading glassmaking center in the world. We don't know for sure, but it's most likely that the glass that Galileo used was made here. They still make glass here in the old craftsman's way. Murano made the finest glass of its day, but modern optical glass is far superior. Lens designer Don Dilworth grinds lenses in his basement as a hobby. To make a lens, uh, the process is really very simple. 
you start off with two pieces of glass of, of approximately the right shape. And because of the motions of the grinding machine and the grinding material, the grits that you put between the two pieces of glass, they grind each other. So you grind these things with a fairly coarse um, abrasive until you generate a curve that has what you think is about the right radius. Then you clean everything up and you, you switch to a finer grade of grit and you, you grind again for a few minutes. Then you clean up and you put even a finer grade of grit in. And when you're done, you have a surface which is the right shape and it's very smooth, but it's not shiny yet. Suppose I want this top piece to be concave. That is, to dig out more glass in the middle and not so much out of the edges. Well, it's very simple. You put the grid on the bottom one, have this be the top one, and as it moves back and forth, the edge of the bottom one is going to grind away the center of this one because the weight of this one is on this, the center. There's not much grinding at the edges. If I wanted to grind this the other way, so the edges were grown, I put this one on the bottom of the machine and put the other one on, the other piece of glass on top. So it's really just whichever one is on top becomes concave, and the rate at which it changes, you control by um, how much wiggling you do, how much pressure you do, and what size grit you're, you're using. For polishing, you make what we call a pitch lap, which is molten pitch, and you pour it over the tool. And when it's cooled just enough to have the right consistency, you put the lens on it, and you press them together gently. And when it's cooled an additional amount that's just right, you put the lead weight on it, which presses the two together, and then you get the pitch lap to match the shape of the lens exactly. When you get done with the grinding, you have something which is ready for polishing. Now, instead of a grit that's rolling and grinding, the little particles of polishing compound will stick in the pitch, and they'll act like little knives that, that play in the glass, and they'll smooth it off. Uh, this is the, the most lengthy part of the process, but this is what produces the final uh, very glossy lens surface. Galileo's case, it was, it was strictly trial and error. They had a piece of glass. They didn't know what it was. They didn't know its properties. In a workshop not unlike this one, Galileo first heard that a Dutch traveler had exhibited in Venice a new arrangement of two lenses that could make a ship appear close by while it was still some distance at sea. It was the telescope. Historian of science, Al Van Helden, has worked out the development of the telescope. So the spectacle makers did it at last. Yeah, they finally did it. And it, uh, it, it took them three centuries. Um, two kinds of uh, glasses, you might call them, are involved. Uh, the first one is a magnifying glass, and it, it, it dates from about the end of the 13th century, say around 1300. And, and it was used by uh, aging scholars whose uh, eyesight was getting weak, as they said then, and who used it to enlarge the, the print, or, or the, they didn't have print then, but, but the, the writing. Manuscript. We uh, saw an early painting of, of an old that, scholar wearing just such glasses. That's right, and it, it was, a, of course, a kind of glass that you would find amongst the, in, in the scholarly community, amongst all the people. When, when, you, when you hold it above, uh, above the print, you can, you can see how it, how it enlarges uh, the, the writing. And if you put it close to your eye, uh, you, can, you can wear it as uh, what we call a spectacle. So that's the origin of spectacles, and that is, that is the one kind of, of, of glass. Now, the other kind is the kind of glass that was used by young people, it still is today, to see things that are in the distance. People have this sort of weak vision of the young, as they used to call it. And that appears 
to make things smaller. Mm -hmm. So if you hold it above the, the, the writing, you can see it, it becomes smaller. If you take the concave glass and hold it up to your eye and, and look at a distant object through it, like a church steeple, you see it clearly in focus, but smaller. If you then put the, the concave, uh, sorry, the convex glass in front of it, uh, you still see things in focus and about the same size, but as you move the convex glass farther and farther away, it's like a zoom effect. The distant object appears to become larger and larger and larger, and that's as, as much magnification as you're going to get and that's the telescopic effect and I'm holding in effect a sort of a telescope in my hand now without a tube. That was the size of the original Dutch telescope. That's, that's right. It magnified about three times and it was about a foot long. Yeah. And of course we chose the lenses to be like that and that's, they had them around. They were standard lenses of the day. That's right. These are optical replicas of, of lenses that they had in those days and you could find these in the, in the inventory of an average spectacle maker uh, by the beginning of the 17th century and so therefore uh, following this sort of line of argument, uh, as soon as the components became available, the instrument was invented. So it's quite easy to make the combination, and that explains to me, as you've written, how it is that Galileo could reinvent the telescope from the rumors and the descriptions in a short time, in days or weeks maybe. And the key thing is he developed it from there. Yes, it is what happened next where yes. Galileo is so important for us. What a summer and fall of hard work they must have had, Galileo and his craftsman partner, to make the first set of telescopes. They had to find the best glass, to make lenses unknown to the spectacle makers, and steadily to improve and develop their instrument. We are lucky enough to have, from the collection of the Grand Duke himself, an instrument pretty surely of the first year of their work. When I look through at the daytime sky, I see little but a circle of light. Those who followed worked out many improvements of the new telescope. The improvement began with Galileo himself. He writes, the instrument must be held firm, and hence it is good to escape the shaking of the hand, which arises from motion of the arteries and from breathing, to fix the tube in some stable place. It is best the tube be capable of being lengthened a bit, say about three or four inches, because I find that to see distinctly nearby objects, the tube should be longer and shorter for those more distant. It is good that the convex glass, which is the one far from the eye, should be partly covered, since thus are objects seen more distinctly. With the camera playing the role of the old telescope, it is easy to accept that the threefold magnification of the Dutch telescope over the direct view was worthwhile. But it is still more striking to see the ninefold magnification of Galileo's telescope, the one that he brought to this very place to look at that very view in August of 1609. He did not stop there. He went to 20 power by November and to 30 power by January. And he entered with his telescope into that new cosmos where scientific instruments have pursued understanding ever since. It would be a mistake to imagine that astronomy began with Galileo or with the Greeks, or with anyone else you might name. It is very old, perhaps as old as humankind. Over the long span of time, everything that can be seen today with unaided eye was noticed, even events as rare as eclipses and comets. Practical sky lore was in place. Every country person knew then what few of us know now, that the full moon always rises as the sun goes down. The skies were well understood in a different way by the mathematical, who could reckon sky positions and times very well indeed. The accurate star map and metal, and the geometrically plotted sky of this thousand-year-old Arabic calculator, are witness to a sophistication beyond any simple lore. The precise calendar we use today was entirely a pre-telescopic development. Finally, there was a point of view that arose from both sources, a philosophical picture of the universe. 
the artists of this superb medieval mosaic in Sicily evoked it in its glowing symmetry. The philosophers said, motion on earth is haphazard, but in the heavens it was circular, perfect. Matter on earth is usually dull stuff, but in the heavens all was luminous. Here on earth we know birth and death, growth and decay, but the celestial world was everlasting. From creation, our universe was split into two, the heavens from the earth. How could two such different worlds ever be one? With his first astronomical telescope, Galileo healed the split between the heavens and the earth. What marvels he saw. The moon has been rising full on the cities of the world for a long time, and on Florence's cathedral a few thousand times. But only when Galileo turned a magnifying instrument to the surface of the moon was he able to see the substance of the heavens. This is what he says of it. On the fourth or fifth day after new moon, when the moon is seen with brilliant horns, the boundary which divides the dark part from the light traces out an uneven, rough, and wavy line. There is a similar sight on earth about sunrise. When we behold the valleys not yet flooded with light, though the mountains surrounding them already are ablaze with glowing splendor on the side opposite the sun. He could see the light change on the moon as he watched. And indeed, with a small telescope, anyone can do that now, as I have enjoyed doing many times in the past. And he goes on. Just as the shadows and the hollows on Earth diminish in size as the sun rises higher, so those spots on the moon lose their blackness as the illuminated region grows larger and larger. Sunrise in the mountains of the moon. More than that, he saw the geography of the moon. He writes, There's another thing which I must not omit, for I beheld it, not without a certain wonder. This is that almost in the center of the moon there is a cavity larger than all the rest and perfectly round in shape. I have tried to represent it as correctly as possible. As to light and shade, it offers the same appearance as would a region like Bohemia, if that were enclosed on all sides by very lofty mountains arranged in a circle. He saw the moon as a place, and he was the first artist of its landscape. The message that the moon had plains and mountains like the Earth was not the only remarkable message from the stars that Galileo wrote of when he had used his telescope. He had, a few months before the book appeared, noticed that near Jupiter, three faint small stars lay in a straight line. This puzzled him a little, and he duly followed it for a while to discover, to his astonishment, that those little stars were companions to Jupiter. They danced around Jupiter, sometimes hidden, sometimes there were four, three, two, and they made a regular procession whose dance he choreographed in the beginning, in the first book. He was so excited by this regular and unprecedented appearance that he followed it wherever he went with his telescope. From many places, even when he made a trip to Rome. And within two or three years, he had cataloged the entire dance quite well, so that afterwards, he was able to calculate a prediction for where the moons of Jupiter would be for a few months ahead. His telescope and its discoveries a sensation. Galileo came back to Florence as mathematician and philosopher to the Grand Duke of Tuscany. A few years later, while guest of a wealthy friend at this villa north of the city, he wrote of new results. Sunspots, the crescent of Venus, a hint of the rings of Saturn. But it was the four moons of Jupiter 
and the mountain landscapes on our own moon that changed our view of the world forever. All of a sudden, people lived in an entirely different world. The satellites of Jupiter were a, a, a sudden, dramatic, and marvelous discovery for, for several reasons. Uh, first of all, they showed that there is more than one center of motion in the universe, that the Earth is by no means the only planet, according to Copernicus, that, that, would, that would have a moon. No matter what system of the world you believed in, uh, there had to be more than one center of motion. And, of course, finally, it is the glamour of the discovery and the fact that, that, that Galileo tied, tied their name to the house of the Medici. It's true, but I guess I feel that substance is even more important than motion. The notion that the moon was made of stuff like the Earth and had mountains and rocks and was not a celestial place of some mysterious kind, that seems to me to license science to go anywhere. But I still think that the main thing is that unforgettable sentence in Sidereus Nuncius with the drawings that says, this portion of the moon resembles the plains of Bohemia, which is a direct connection between the heavenly world, or at least the lunar world, and the Earth. I think it got him into more trouble and started more speculation, and at the same time represented a bigger jump for science than anything else. Because once you say that the heavenly bodies are like the Earth in some respects, then I think you're open to pushing science out into the heavens as far as we'll go, and probably, as we now know, down into the center of matter as far as we'll go. Yes, it's not only saying it, of course, it's demonstrating it's it. it. Yeah. Yes, that's also a, a discovery that is more accessible uh -huh. uh, to, the, to the common ordinary observer. Even a, a modest uh, powered spyglass will reveal the marvelous nature of the moon, and it just hits you smack between the eyes, so Were there a lot of people doing that in, in that Yes, part? yes. If I say 1620, I uh -huh. think that, 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 that five or six power spyglasses must have existed by the hundreds and perhaps thousands in Europe, uh, so that, that the moon was really readily accessible uh, to not only the imagination of scientists, but the imagination of poets and what have you, and, and we know that from the literature. Yeah. The moons of Jupiter are harder to... Well, they're not so hard to see. No, but, uh, but you need a bit more power to see them, especially uh, in the 17th century with the small apertures, and you need m more patience to, to work on them. The patience is what hurts. Oh, you yes. can look at them once, but to follow them, the weather turns bad, you forget, you have to go away in the weekend. You yes. don't really, I never get a good series. That's right, with the satellites of Jupiter, it's their motion yeah. that, that distinguishes them with, with the moon. It's, it's, it's a quick look that that's, does it. That's, that's right. right. So it's a sequence or a quick look, and that, right. that is a real difference. That's right. The publication of Galileo's telescopic discoveries made a sensation. He brought his telescopes to Rome for the first time with serious purpose. He wanted to show them in detail to his scientific peers, the Jesuit mathematicians and astronomers at the Collegio Romano. They had read the book, but now they could see the instruments for themselves. The princes and the prelates the dukes and the cardinals were not long behind. On one occasion, from a villa on this very hill, he invited the party to look through his magnifying tube at a distant familiar church. They could see it in all detail. If the tube reported so faithfully something they knew well, was it not credible when it brought them the sight of the invisible moons of Jupiter? No doubt of it. His spring trip to Rome ended in triumph. His friend, the painter Ludovico Cigoli, shared the view of the moon through Galileo's telescope. The artist's vision was deeply stirred. Cigoli was commissioned by the Pope to paint an image in the papal chapel of a great church in Rome. He chose to represent the Virgin, who is often shown as standing on the crescent moon. In the portrait, the Virgin was familiar enough but the moon was entirely different. What had always been flawless in form was now a telescopic moon, mountainous, cratered, earthy, like the one he had seen in the telescope. With this painting, the instrumental view of the skies had entered the world of the imagination. But there was a deep conflict between novelty and authority. In the end, the old man was brought down. Galileo was required to pass his last years quietly in this house, 
in the hills of Florence. A new structure to the heavens and more novelty year by year does not sound very biblical to us. Nor did it appeal to the conservative churchmen of that day. The story is often told. Finally, the Inquisition moved to silence Galileo, and he spent his last eight or ten years under a mild house arrest, working to the last year or two of his life. He had to send his final book to be published in a Protestant land and no longer in Italy. The tragedy is understandable. It's the tragedy of a man and a social tragedy, the problem of human society. It was a time of great conflict, and the issues of substance faded away under the great issue of power and authority. But science did not suffer in that tragedy. The moons of Jupiter still dance, and the planets and the sun still spin, and the evidence the telescope brought is there still for all to see. Even in Galileo's time, say one generation after his death, there were a dozen observatories in Europe. Men with better instruments, able to see more detail and fainter objects, and to measure more carefully, tested and expanded upon what he had seen. The century of telescopic discovery began when Galileo watched the sunrise in the mountains of the moon. By century's end, Newton had unified the motion of a falling apple with the orbit of the moon. Galileo had recognized a familiar landscape in a distant and lonely world. That unifying experience lies at the very heart of Newton's profound theory. The universe of science cannot be split. Visible substance, like calculable motion, is everywhere. That the planets are ruled by a central stationary sun is what the historians still pick out as the great issue of Galileo's time. Who can deny its importance? But for me, and in our time, I think as we look back to Galileo, we see most of all the telescope. The telescope brings evidence which remains. Theory may come and go, but the moons are there. The telescope improves. Are there only four? Can we count five? Why were the tables wrong? Can we measure more carefully? And that goes on today. Here we are, within sight of his last home, and we are on the grounds of a modern observatory, the Astrophysical Observatory of Florence, where there are many instruments, telescopes, of kinds that he could not have foreseen, working daily to gain new experience, to understand the world of the heavens. And that is characteristic for the development of science from a look at the world and not merely at the satisfactory papers that rationalize it for us. People have been coming to this Vermont hilltop to celebrate the telescope for 50 years. They are amateur telescope makers. Men, women, young people, all of them have made telescopes for their personal use, or at least dream of making them. The telescopes they make are as different as they can be, yet they visibly belong to that great family of development that began with Galileo. For me, these people too belong to Galileo's extended family. They carry out in our time, with the technology of our day, the kind of thoughtful work of the hands 
that Galileo and his craftsmen did so long ago. Uh, this is a, uh, my first telescope, a 10-inch Newtonian. Uh, I ground and figured... Your first telescope? Yeah. You made something like this, the first one that you've made? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I've been waiting for a long time to, uh, to have a telescope. It's a 10-inch. Made the primary mirror, uh, finished that in April. Mm -hmm. Had it on the sky last night, it performed beautifully. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy with it. Of course, when you have lenses in the tube, because there's a relay go effect going on, you've relayed the aperture several places, and you can put stops in there. Uh -huh. So it's actually so somewhat better than it looks. Yeah. Like, uh -huh. like coming in, it's uh -huh. you know, out, 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 of, out of the field yeah. here, would, would, would be caught by a metal diaphragm uh -huh. in, in here somewhere. And you said that it uh, has a field big enough to admit the full moon. You can see the entire full moon if you have a, a wide angle. The images we are brought by today's big telescopes are beyond what Galileo might have dreamed of. Yet from spectacle lenses on to this mirror intended for Earth orbit, the technology remains recognizable. Astronomy is not all of science, and scientific instruments are not all beautiful tubes and big mirrors and lenses. Out of this homely and somewhat unpleasant experience, there has grown a powerful scientific instrument for the biologist. You see the roots of the matter here, and its fruit as well, on this tomato, where a mold has appeared. Unmistakable. Clear. But what is that structure? We can be all but certain that a week or two ago, there landed on that fine nutrient surface one single airborne spore, a kind of seed for the mold, and that it found itself in the appropriate environment to grow, and it grew until it became entirely visible, conspicuous to us. The single spore has made itself into a kind of living amplifier. The exploitation of that process in a controlled way is now to be found in heavy use in every microbiological laboratory in the world. These clear spots are colonies of virus, growing not on the skin of a tomato, but on a layer of living bacteria, itself held in a petri dish. Like the single mold, each of these visible spots started with one invisible, infectious particle. We provided that virus with healthy host cells growing on the surface. Each submicroscopic virus has multiplied into a plainly seen sample, a clone of virus, easy to count, test, and transfer. This culture dish is itself a kind of instrument, a living amplifier, bringing evidence we would not otherwise know. Instruments differ as much as a moldy tomato differs from a shining mirror in space. In the weeks ahead, a yellow rental van will help us measure the entire Earth. A drill ship at sea with its all-night labs will seek a mystery below the ocean floor. A coordinated pair of laser beams will coax one single atom to pose quietly for its picture. All of those are instruments for science. Hooray for instruments. Some instruments we inherit at birth and know well how to use. The eyes, the ears, the probing touch, the human senses in general. Some instruments are those made by science and technology, old and new. I regard the two classes as very close relatives. The lens of glass is not very different from the living lens of the eye. Accounts of science rarely center on the instruments. They focus more on the findings, the concepts, the high results of science. Those are the building blocks of the house of science. But the instruments are the builder's tools. 
They help quarry the blocks in the first place. They fit and level them. The construction of science is even more intricate than that. Notice that a theory that has been held for some time is almost bound to fit. It is tested repeatedly with similar experience. Its edges are well worn. With such a past, we need something new. That is the way to challenge a complacent theory. Then a new instrument that can look from a new angle becomes more than a means. It is a real test, the guarantor of our understanding. New findings, new theories, stimulate new instruments in turn. It is an exciting round. Important questions, hard-won answers, then newer and sharper questions. The instruments and the new experiences they bring set the lively rhythm in every active science. Major funding for the Ring of Truth was provided by Polaroid Corporation. For 50 years, we've been bringing art and science together to change the way people see the world. Polaroid. Additional funding was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Public Broadcasting Stations, National Science Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations. The Ring of Truth book can be ordered direct by calling 1-800-441-3000. Have your credit card ready. Video cassettes for schools, colleges, and individuals can be purchased by calling 1-800-424-7963. The book, 1-800-441-3000. Cassettes, 1-800-424-7963.